Thank you, and um, thank you very much for coming. Um, as Laura said, I'm an occupational therapist, and we're going to be talking today about discharge planning. And I just want to preface the talk by saying that some of this may feel a little bit uncomfortable because I am looking critically at what we do in discharge planning, but I also want to say that, as Laura said, this stems out of my experience working as an occupational therapist in older adult rehabilitation and complex continuing care. And so when I, when I was working, I had some troubles and some moral issues with discharge planning, and so that's what brought me to these studies. But I would also assume that if you were here this morning, you might also have some questions about how we're doing things. And so I hope that we can have an interesting discussion afterwards. And I should also say that this, is, uh, this work is mainly my doctoral research, along with some uh, two, two secondary analyses that have been done since then that have been interspersed into the presentation. So the objectives for today are to increase awareness of how various elements in our practice contexts can influence our perspectives and our actions in discharge planning, and to explore what perhaps we can do to better align discharge planning practices with the aims of rehabilitation. In order to do this in the next 45 minutes or so, we'll be looking a little bit first at discharge planning. What is it? Why should we look at it? The theoretical perspective that has oriented my work. What were the research aims and the methods? And then get into some more interesting results and implications for practice. All right. So discharge planning, in the literature, discharge planning is the development of a comprehensive and effective plan to meet the needs of the patient after discharge with a goal of maintaining or improving health outcomes. And so I understand that there may be some, some surgeons or somebody in the audience who may disagree. I think that all of the care that we provide for the patient is very important, but from my perspective, I don't know if you know, it was new to me, I knew, I knew the concept of a linchpin before doing this presentation, but that is what a linchpin looks like. And I look at the discharge planning process as the linchpin of the healthcare process. Because if we look at the individual, the individual comes in, they have an, an issue, perhaps they have surgery, they're in acute care, they receive many interventions, they receive rehabilitation care, and we put all of this money and all of this care into the patient. But if the patient then goes home to an environment where they're not supported and they sustain new harms, then what was the point of doing it in the first place? And so I think the discharge planning process is quite an important piece of the healthcare we provide. If we look at it more closely, discharge planning is it's the process of matching an individual's needs and their capabilities to the environment. So what do we mean by that? Well, first of all, in the environment where the individual lives, are they required to have the physical capability, the physical strength and endurance to go up and down the stairs? If the washroom is on the second floor, are they required to have that, those physical capabilities to do it multiple times a day? Are they going to be obliged to do things like make their own meals? If they are going to make their own meals, then they would need the cognitive and physical capacities to do that. Do they also require the cognitive capacity to plan for the meals, to plan which ingredients they might need, to be able to get those ingredients? So you can start to see there are, there are multiple skills that, are, that the environment implicitly demands of us. If we look more at the community level, what is, how is this individual's community? What sorts of capacities are required in that community? If they are going to get those uh, ingredients that we were just discussing, how does the market look? Is it something where they have to walk? Do they need to be able to take a cab to get to it? Do they need to be able to drive? And now if we start, stop looking at what the individual demands of us, but let's look a little tiny bit at what it might afford for us. Because I would speculate that most of you don't only do things because you need to. We like to do things because they are good for our, our well-being, for our identity. They bring us pleasure and they bring us joy, which in turn affects our health and well-being. And so in, in our home environments, what sorts of opportunities are afforded for us that will also contribute to our health? <laughs> And then finally, in terms of the social context, in the, in the environment, are there lots of individuals who are there for us all the time? Is there somebody at the end of a phone? If we call out, will somebody come from a different room? Or are we required to be able to fend for ourselves or call, call for help? So you can see how 
individuals are inextricably linked to these contexts and it's a give and take in terms of what is required and what you can do in your context. And so I would argue that discharge planning is an incredibly important decision. Discharge planning with older adults is both in the literature and in my own experience and in yours as well, particularly complex. In the case of older adults, there can be in, in many, with many patients, but with older adults there can be many complex family relationships going on. There can be a little bit of a role reversal where the children are taking on a more active or more parental role to the, to the parent when the parent is perhaps doing the converse. There can be an older spouse who's the primary caregiver and this primary caregiver may him or herself have their own issues. There can be multiple individuals involved in the interprofessional care team or perhaps even in different services and everybody might have a different view of what would be the best thing in discharge. In the literature, going back to that definition, it's ideally a collaborative program, a uh, process, sorry. But again, both in the literature and in my experience, and I'm sure in yours as well, there's great variation in terms of how much or how little the older adult and their family members are involved in the process. And some of that may be due to personal preferences or personalities or just how groups work, but some of that in the literature is also related to particular policies that may be in place. So a good example of that was a, a study done by Jillian Motes in Winnipeg, and she looked at the discharge planning process with older adults in acute care, in standard rehabilitation, and in older adult rehabilitation. And she found that there was great variation where on one end of the spectrum in acute care, older adults were involved very little in the discharge planning process. And her theory was that because the focus of the care that's being given there is different, and it didn't afford for as much time, for as much involvement, whereas in older adult in patient rehabilitation, there was much more time for older adults to be involved. And finally, why is it important to study with older adults? Again, it's the geriatric program, I don't need to tell you, but we all know that the older adult population is increasing. And so not only might we all know somebody who's had healthcare services and has had to face discharge planning from older adult uh, services, but I would hope that we would all hope to get there at some point. And so this is an important problem for all of us. And so when I was working as an occupational therapist, I found I, that I had some certain issues with discharge planning. The first of those was in terms of the older adults. They were the ones who were going to be living out the decision. At the end of their six week stay, whether they went to long-term care or back to their home, me as an occupational therapist, it made no difference. They were off my caseload, really, to be cold about it. But for them, it made a significant difference. If we go back to, to the image I had with all of the, the home environment and how that affects you, whether they were in long-term care or in their home, it looked very, very different. And they were the ones who were living out this decision. But I felt that the older adults, in many ways, had very little say in the decision. And that as an occupational therapist, a lot of responsibility was placed on me in terms of making a recommendation. Which brings me to my second issue, that in terms of making the recommendation, I didn't always feel that I was free to make the recommendation that I felt was best for this person. Many, In many cases, it was potentially that their length of stay is up and these are our options right now, or these are our limited options at all. And so my, my recommendations were also being shaped by other influences. I also questioned if we were doing what we promised to do. Are we really providing rehabilitation for this person or are we providing more discharge planning? And are we really taking a client-centered approach? And then finally, what are some of the unintended implications of our practice at this moment for each of the different stakeholders? And by different stakeholders, I mean the older adult, him or herself, family members, healthcare professionals, as well as the healthcare system as a whole. So if we look at what was the theoretical perspective guiding this work, I took a critical bioethics perspective. And generally, critical perspectives look at, they, they look under the face value. They look at under what we see. And how is it potentially that systemic structures or the way that we do things might be marginalizing certain groups or might be setting up situations where some people have more or fewer rights? 
And this being a bioethics perspective, I had to bring in a bioethics theory in there. And the most obvious one was to, to use the, the concept of autonomy. And so traditionally, the concept of autonomy in healthcare is considered under the vision of informed consent. And so is the individual autonomous? Are they able to take all of the information that we are giving to them and to do some mathematical computations and then come to a decision about what they're doing or about what they would like to do? But as I'm sure is your experience in healthcare, it's not always that clear at all. And so feminist theorists have critiqued this, these traditional ideas of autonomy quite, quite heavily. And their critiques stem largely from the idea that it's unrealistic. It's unrealistic to expect individuals to take this information and to remove themselves and to make the decision. So it's unrealistic that they're able to separate themselves in order to make this decision. It's unrealistic to expect that individuals might always have the capability to make the decisions. And so the femin feminist theorists have proposed this idea of relational autonomy. And relational autonomy is a lot of what I was discussing in terms of discharge planning, is the perspective that individuals are inextricably linked to their contexts and that individuals are constantly being influenced and shaped by ideas in their contexts. And that incorporates many, many things. It incorporates both how we might consider uh, other family members or other relationships that we have in our lives. It incorporates how, how we've come to view certain things. So what are perhaps some of the cultural views that shape our expectations and our ways and our values? Additionally, in relational autonomy, there's the idea that not only do our, our contexts constantly shape what we're doing, but they shape the person that we have become. And so in order to explain that, I'll just use a, a brief, but somewhat extreme, but brief example. If we look at perhaps Mrs. Jones, and I did have a client who was similar to this. Um, Mrs. Jones is an older woman. She's had mild stroke. She's in rehabilitation. And when we ask her, where do you want to go when you leave, she can't really give us a straight answer. And is it that she's not capable of making this autonomous decision, that she doesn't have the capacity to, do, to make the decision, or is it perhaps that she's lacking some of the skills to make the decision and we could help her? So if we take a step back and look at Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones was, when, when she was young, she lived on a farm with her family. She was the oldest daughter, and they had multiple children. And so when she was in about grade three, she had to stop going to school so that she could stay home and take, take care of the kids with her mother. And then when she was around 18, she got married to Mr. Jones, and she moved in. And when she lived at home, her, it was a very paternalistic home. Her father made the decisions. When she moved, Mr. Jones made the decisions. He took care of the money. He did all of these things. And so Mrs. Jones has never had to make a very big decision about her own life in this way. And so does she necessarily have, has she practiced this, these, the skills that are required in order to take all this information in? Has she, does she have the self-trust to know that she will make the decision that is best for her? Or is she relying on other people because she's never had to? So from, from a feminist perspective, you can see how relational autonomy places us perhaps not as independently and in the same bubble as traditional views of autonomy may have placed us. And so in approaching this work, the research question was, how is the discharge planning process with older adults, families, and healthcare professionals shaped by the dominant social and political systems and contexts? To break that down and make it a little more easy to understand, um, I wanted to explore the discharge planning process from three different perspectives. Because when I was working, I found, don't, don't we all want the same thing? Don't we just want Mrs. Jones to be well? So why is it that there are so many different ideas of how this might look? And so I wanted to look at it from, from Mrs. Jones's perspective, so the older adult's perspective, what is it that you see in the situation, from the healthcare professional's perspectives, and from the family member's perspectives. I wanted to examine what were some of the aspects of the context that were perhaps influencing the way things were being seen. So when you're saying that you think that this is best, why is it that you think that this is best? Because I, I wouldn't say, but this looks different than what this person thinks that this is best. And so how can, what is it that is shaping the way that we're seeing things? 
how, how is, are these influences in the context affecting the outcomes? They may be shaping our perspectives and our behaviors, but how might they also be affecting the process and the outcomes of discharge planning? And then finally, as part of the secondary analysis, I wanted to look at some of the implications related to client-centered care. In my data collection, I did microethnographic case studies, which is just a big word to say that I did case studies in the context. It was in an older adult rehabilitation center in southern Ontario. And I, I recognize that this is one of those slides they tell you never to have, but at the same time, I think people are interested in knowing who are my participants. And so I had five case studies, which are each of the columns. Each case study was based around one older adult, and so I would recruit the older adult first. Um, once the older adult agreed to participate, and it, it was a prerequisite, that they had family members who were involved in their care. So there was at least one family member in each of the cases. Um, most of them were children or sons-in-law, but one of them, in, in one case, it was a spouse. And then for each one, I also interviewed the healthcare professionals who were most involved in the discharge planning process. And it worked out nicely that across my five cases, I interviewed all of the allied health care team members who were mostly involved in discharge planning. So the OTs, PTs, and social workers on that unit. And I also interviewed two key informants, which in this case were the, the unit manager, who had a physiotherapy background, and the head nurse. And the head nurse, while she wasn't involved specifically in any case, she was involved peripherally in every case. So in total, I had the observations of five discharge planning family conferences and 22 interviews with 20 individuals because two of the healthcare professionals were involved in more than one case. For the analysis, um, if anybody wants to ask more questions about the analysis later, I can get into more depth. But in short, basically what we did following a modification of the Quaylog model, I asked three main sets of questions of the data, where the first, the first set was much more descriptive. What's going on in this case? Who are the players? What are their roles? What are their perspectives? And then moving on to more abstract questions of, based on you know, what I was seeing in my earlier analysis, questions about power and who's making this decision and how are they influencing power? Or how, how are they uh, asserting their power, their autonomy in the case? And then the extra two sets of questions were from the secondary analyses that I did. Okay, so moving on to some of the more interesting stuff. The results of the analysis. Uh, in general, I found that there were three types of, of influences in the context. One of these was underlying beliefs, which were things that people didn't necessarily explicitly name, but that were visible in the way they spoke. Valued approaches were things that people did name and say, I do this. And conventions and practices were the way things were done. So if we get into them a little bit more closely. In terms of an underlying belief, the big one, which I'm sure does not come as any surprise to anybody here today, was that there was this expectation that aging was a time of decline. It was expected that as older adults got older, they would retreat from decision making about their care and that somebody else would come in to take their place. So there was an expected reliance on younger family members. And this was visible in everybody's interviews, older adults, family members, healthcare professionals. So for example, if we look at Sophia, who is one of the older adults, when I asked her who's making the decision of where you're going, she said, my daughter and my son, and I've got no choice to say no because they know better than me now. I can't do anything without my children now. So the part that you don't know is that three weeks prior to that, she was living in her own home and she had been doing so for multiple years. She was a very strong matriarch. She'd been making all of the decisions. And we can see how in her answer, she's limiting herself. I can't do anything without my children now. They know better than me. So she is imposing this as we get older. This is how it goes, idea on herself. If we asked her son, who's making this decision about where, where your mom's going, he said, she's kind of leaving it up to the kids. I think that's basically all it is. She doesn't really have any role. And so we can see that he also says, well, you know, she's getting older, she's not really doing it. She's leaving it to us. And there's another distinction, I don't know if some of you may have picked out. She says, I've got no choice to say no. That's just how it is. And he says, she's leaving it up to us. So there is also a different attribution where she says, you know, 
this is how things are. I can't really help it. And then he's saying, well, she's letting us do it. So there's that slight distinction as well. If we look at the healthcare professionals, when asked who's making these decisions, one said, if they're competent to make their own decisions and implement all the recommendations that we're making, then we deal mainly with the patient. Generally here in this population, it's an older population. Generally the family is very involved. So we can see again how there's this expectation that it's an older population. The family will be very involved. A second underlying belief was that we as healthcare professionals seem to feel that our views are what is most important and that perhaps the, what the older adult may feel might not be as important. So if we ask, again, looking at this underlying belief of the primacy of healthcare professionals' knowledge, who is making the discharge decision? When I asked what's the client's role in discharge, pretty much to participate in their therapy, in their assessments. Patients generally here aren't as involved. More things are done for them or to them to help them. We'll talk about this one in a little bit more depth quickly. But when I asked the older adult what's the healthcare professional's team in discharge planning, she said, well, the occupational therapist gave me a list to read. I don't go by that list. So we can see how there might have been a different perception in terms of how important our input as healthcare professionals is. <laughs> All right. If we move on now to the idea of what makes a home a home, because in discharge, that's what we're deciding. Where is this person's home going to be? When I asked, I asked everybody, what is important in a home? And when I asked, everybody said question, answered things like, you know, to be in my own space, to be able to know where all of my things are, to be close to my things, to be close to my family. Um, when I asked healthcare professionals, they might say things like, to be able to walk to Starbucks, to be able to be close to the programs for my kids. But then, when, when we looked at the provision, if we shift just quickly to providing client-centered care, this meant involving the client and doing what the client wants. But when we looked at discharge, I feel that client-centeredness is not always doing, sorry, does not always mean that we go with what they want. It has to be a balance between honoring their wish, but also maintaining safety. But then this idea of honoring their wish what might be their wish in terms of returning home, it might be to be close to their things, to be, to be in, in their community, to be in their own home, to be in their own space. But that was never mentioned. The only time that perhaps honoring their wish was mentioned was when I asked explicitly about client-centered care. More importantly, it was about maintaining safety. I always try to be client-centered in my approach. I advocate for what the patient wants, as long as it's safe. Ah, my colors aren't working well. <laughs> But, so we can see, again, it, it was perhaps a limited view that client-centeredness is doing what they want, as long as it's safe. But this idea, that was the only time it was mentioned, that they might want to be in their own home, that they might want to be in their own community, was never really revisited. So if we move on then to this valued approach that was explicitly named, I, I promote safety, a safe discharge for me is a good discharge. And then there was this idea, somebody mentioned about disaster discharges. So I said, well, when you say that the, the discharge plan is a disaster, you mean in terms of what they've put in place? And then the person said, in terms of them not following our recommendations. And they leave and we're very anxious because we know it's not safe, but that's what they've decided they want to do. So if we go back to this idea of the primacy of healthcare professional knowledge, if we look in this, this answer as well, in terms of them not following our recommendations, because we know that what they're doing is not safe. So the implication is our recommendations are the right ones. So I realize I'm being very critical, but I'm a healthcare professional too. Be critical of myself as well. <laughs> All right, so moving on to the third way, uh, the third influence in discharge planning was to look at the structure of discharge planning. So in this unit, as it is in many rehabilitation units, it was a four week stay. And from the first, on the first day, on the day of admission, the discharge date was set for four weeks later, and the discharge planning family conference was set for two weeks into the stay. But then that meant that the focus was entirely on discharge. And so as one healthcare professional said, discharge planning is what I do. That's, I'd say, my primary job here, because it's such a short length of stay. I actually think that I get four weeks to discharge plan on this unit. The other thing about the way that the Discharge Planning Family Conference was set up is that it was in the setup of the room. So you can see how in this room, in general, 
the healthcare professionals would sit in the chairs at the top and then along the right side of the, of the wall at the table. The older adult would sit at one of the chairs by the door, and then the family members would sit in the, in the chairs along the left-hand side in the bottom, even though they were invited to sit at the table. And then there would be uh, an individual, a healthcare professional, sitting at the chair at the computer who is taking notes. And we can see how perhaps this is not the best setup to enable a collaborative process or a collaborative decision. <laughs> The other aspect of this is in terms of the timing and the way that it worked and everybody's roles. So each one of the district plan and family conferences happened in the exact same way that when, when we started, one of the healthcare professionals listed the individual's goals, which were said in very medical language to the older adult. Then all the healthcare professionals would list off their assessment results, which were often, again, using terms like navigating the stairs or things like that. They might not make as a tremendous amount of sense to the healthcare professional or to the family members or the older adults. And then they discussed their discharge planning recommendations. And then if there was time, the older adults were asked what they thought or there was time for questions. And so it was a very medically imposed process in terms of how it was going that again was perhaps not enabling the most collaborative decision. All right, so what are some of the implications of some of this? I split this up into three different points, and we'll go through them in turn. So in terms of the marginalization of older adults, I would argue that many of these influences that I just discussed added up to marginalize older adults. So primarily, this belief linking aging to decline, which meant that perhaps we expected older adults wouldn't be as participatory in the decision-making process. Beliefs that privileged our way of thinking and our way of doing things, where not only do we expect them to be less involved, but we expect that we have the right answers anyways. What was the way that the Discharge Planning Family Conference was structured might, again, not have enabled lots of collaboration. And this view of client-centered as maximizing safety meant that older adults were little involved in their own discharge decision-making process in this study. And they weren't permitted to make risky choices. And in, in each one of the cases, there was a, a recommendation for 24-hour care. In this case, risky choices was the idea that all of the older adults, all five of them, wanted to go home. Some of them said with no care. Some of them were willing to accept some care. But what is this risky choice? It was that the older adults wanted to live at home alone. But what are some of the really big risks if we look at individuals living home alone? They're, they're, in general, what is named in the literature are falls and fires. If we look at the incidence of falls, there, the World Health Organization says that one in three individuals over the age of 65 will sustain a fall in a period of one year. But if we actually look at the CHI-HI data, admissions or treatments that are given as a result of a fall are on par with those that are given for driving or driving accidents. And so we do, I acknowledge that we put limits on driving in terms of you have to have a license, there are certain age groups, you need to have um, a, uh, a seatbelt and all of that. But do we put as many limitations on driving as we do on perhaps individuals not being permitted to return home? And if we look at the amount of time that is spent in a car and the amount of time that is spent li living, because the falls data is one person in a whole year, whereas the driving data is only for the amount of time that's spent in a car, Perhaps driving is a lot more dangerous than living alone. And if we also look at the Kai High data related to injuries related to winter sports activities, those are also quite high. And so we have, we've had you know, health participation entire campaigns that are promoting these winter sports activities, but these are also the root cause of many injuries. And so should we really be limiting this idea of living alone as much as we are? If we look again at this idea of where we live, as we were discussing earlier, occupations and the things we do really affect our identity and our health and our well-being. And where we live greatly shapes whether we can do and participate in, in many of these occupations. The implications of 24-hour care may greatly be that an individual has to move. And so this has some very huge implications for older adults. Is safety really what we want to be putting as the most important idea in guiding our discharge planning recommendations. 
Then the second part is looking at rehabilitation, perhaps not necessarily anymore as rehabilitation, but more as having the overarching focus on discharge planning. If we go back to our earlier diagram, that on the date of admission, the individual was brought in, the discharge planning family conference was scheduled for four weeks later, uh, sorry, for two weeks later, and the discharge for four weeks. And so this meant, as per the healthcare professionals telling us, that in the first two weeks were spent making assessments to make discharge recommendations. In the second two weeks were spent making all of these recommendations, putting all of the services in place. And so where is the room left for the rehabilitation interventions that are actually going to help the individual to get better or to regain their capabilities? Not only might this have significant implications for older adults who may not regain their abilities or their family members, but it can have significant implications, I argue, for healthcare professionals. Healthcare professionals generally, if we look at the literature, and I'm sure if we asked all of you today, go into this profession because we want to help people. But are we really being permitted to do so? On one side, we have increasingly shorter lengths of stays, we have the conventions of the way things have always been done. We have these discharge timelines that are quite often imposed by the hospital or the health or our managers. And we may also have limited options for care. We'll talk about that later on. So that's on the one side. And then on the other side, we're also being told you have to provide a client-centered approach and rehabilitation and what you want to do and what the client wants are interventions to regain their function and their capabilities. And are these things really working out? Or are we being pulled in too many directions? And the literature does show that people are being pulled in too many directions, and this leads to ethical tensions and professional burnout and a high turnover. Client-centered approaches in the literature are a partnership between the therapist and clients to empower clients to engage in functional performance to fulfill occupational roles. And this involves coordinating with the older adult, coordinating with, coordinating with various aspects or various people in their context. It involves looking at the whole picture in the integration of care. Quite often in healthcare services, it was my experience in rehabilitation, I saw them for these four weeks and that was it. Perhaps I got to see you know, their papers two days before they came from acute care and then I would give papers to the CCAC and they would leave and that was it. But it's very fragmented. Are we being enabled to provide this client-centered care that looks at the individual over the longer perspective? What are some of the barriers that we may be experiencing in relation to client-centered care? I'm sure that some of you have lots of ideas in your head. Well, primarily there is this heavy focus on safety, that everything that we do is safe. If we walk into any healthcare institution, patient safety is very big in the models and in, and in what is in the literature. From where does that really come? Is it So there are some theories that it's related to professional or institutional liability, but at the same time, how realistic is that? There's very liter little literature on this topic in terms of, of liability or the repercussions of unsafe actions. In, sorry, I should say, in medicine there is a lot, but in rehabilitation there's very little. What about our professional mandates? How much are they promoting this idea of patient safety? Another barrier might be that clients are coming to us quicker and sicker. We all know that. That they're coming to us perhaps in rehabilitation when they still are, when they perhaps should still be in acute care and they're too tired and they're still recovering and they're not ready to engage in rehabilitation just yet. Not only are they coming quicker and sicker, but there are the shorter lengths of stay. And so not only may they not necessarily be ready to participate in the, in the beginnings of rehabilitation, but the, the stays are getting longer. And so those weeks that would have been more important at the end, they're getting trimmed off. And we have higher caseloads and we have fewer hours to spend with each client. And finally, client-centered care is rather complex. Understanding this individual, taking into account their values, their perspective, their preferences, as well as all of their strengths and their unique living environment or circumstance is a very complex process. And so in light of all of these pushes for efficiency, having less, amount of, less time to do things, is there time to do the complex client-centered approach or is it a lot easier perhaps to go for efficiency and lead to a quick, an easier discharge? 
So I ask the question, are we really as healthcare professionals enabled to do this client-centered care that we are touted to be doing and that we are supposed to be doing? Oh, sorry, one more point. <laughs> Also, the lack of availability of services or resources. As we were talking, there may, upon discharge, be very limited services. We know that this individual would need this, but that it's not available in their community or that it's not available frequently enough. And so, again, is that providing a client-centered approach for the client? So now if we move on to the big question of, are we meeting anyone's needs? If we go back to our little diagram, these discharge planning recommendations are happening quickly. And so we have to make the discharge recommendations in the first two weeks of the inpatient stay. But early in the inpatient stay, both the literature and I'm sure your experience tells us that individuals have low function, low strength, low endurance. And so the literature says this is not the right time to be making an adequate prognosis of what this individual is going to need in two, four, six, eight weeks. All of these decisions are being made in this aura that we must maximize safety. And again, when there are a few options. Um, I'm not exactly sure how it is in Ottawa, but I would suspect that it's similar to how it is in the GTA area, that there are few options for home care. We know that private home care is quite expensive and publicly funded home care is incredibly limited. And so my, my participants told me, in many cases, we err on the side of caution and we make 24-hour care recommendations because we know that that's better value for the client's money. If they get 24-hour care recommendations, if they go to long-term care, then they'll be safe and it's more affordable than having somebody come in a few hours of the day in their home. Or if they get a live-in caregiver, caregiver, again, it's more affordable because you can take off the cost of the room and board. And so the 24-hour, it seemed to be that there was this dichotomy, either 24-hour care recommendations or they'll get nothing. And so more often than not, it was erring on the side of 24-hour care recommendations. But is this really meeting anybody's needs? If we look at older adults and families, this involves a very significant change in their life. And if we look at the healthcare system, 70% of patients could be better managed for fewer dollars in the home environment. And so if we're asking older adults and families to make this significant change that might complicate things a lot, but yet in a few months, they may not need to be in long-term care, are we meeting the older adults and the family's needs? And are we meeting the healthcare system's needs or are we making the healthcare system spend more dollars than perhaps it needs to? And so, what might be some of the ways that move forward for us to move forward? We may have to examine some of our perspectives of how much we value aging and what are our expectations of aging. But this might be in healthcare contexts as well as in societal contexts. If we see this as my joke for the day. <laughs> um, we, I, you may have seen jokes like this before. The old man says, the internet is so fascinating. And she says, that's the microwave. Like, this joke, it, it is funny, but it promotes the idea that older adults get dumber as they get older and that they don't know the difference and they can't learn and they can't adapt. Um, if we also look at the woman, she's holding her little walker and that's drawn in a rather comical way. Or if we have this new, this new saying of, oh, I just had a senior's moment. Well, what is your senior's moment? Your senior's moment is probably when you forgot or when you tripped. It's all associated with negative things. So th these, these ways of having our culture infiltrate through humor, through little expressions, does promote the idea that aging is perhaps bad or aging is a time of decline, which isn't always the case. So additionally, in addition to examining our perspectives on aging and risk, I would ask that we look at our understandings and applications of client-centeredness and what does that mean in practice? Because as, as I argued, I strongly feel that perhaps as healthcare professionals, we're not being able to provide this client-centered care. We're being pulled in too many directions. We may also need to look at what are some of the policies that are shaping our practice and that are perhaps impeding us from providing this client-centered practice. Perhaps we need to change the way we do our processes to enable more collaboration. Or perhaps we need to look at the system on the whole to see what services we can offer and what services should be provided. And perhaps in that way, we can better meet the needs of older adults, 
families, as well as healthcare professionals and the healthcare system, which affects all Canadians. <laughs> and so in terms of take home questions, I would invite you and in perhaps in our discussion in the next little bit to think about what is client-centeredness and how is it or is it not reflected in our practices? Is our practice aligned with our values in terms of healthcare professionals as individuals, but also in terms of the program or the healthcare system? And is there perhaps a need for a systemic evaluation of our values and how we want to approach that? And finally, this is just my little personal punch that relational approaches are perhaps help to guide a more encompassing way of looking at clients. And is that something that we should incorporate in our professional ways of looking at things or in our education? And so I thank many individuals and I thank all of you for coming today and I would invite any questions that you may have, any discussion. Thank you so much.